Even the Teletubbies could hide better than that. So this scene is beautiful, but... Massive firefight. The bad guys, the black and tans, usually wore some dark green. I don't know if you can see, but basically the same color as I'm wearing. Hold on, no! Are we the baddies? Hi, and welcome to History Legends. In this video, we'll do a step-by-step -step historical breakdown of a shocking Irish war movie called The Wind That Shakes the Barley. A big thank you to all my Patreons for sponsoring this video. Are you ready? This will not be your typical movie reaction. Let's go! Alright, so this is set during the Irish War of Independence between the Irish Republican Army and British forces. It's also inspired by an actual battle, the Kill Michael Ambush, November 1920. So you see, he's giving orders to all the men before the ambush. I love it. We rarely see the part before an ambush. You know, preparing an ambush is not hiding near the road and waiting for the enemy to come. It requires a lot of planning. I know it's hard for the movie to show this, but keep in mind that the IRA volunteers walked 12 miles through the darkness all night on the pouring rain up to the ambush spot. So when he's giving out orders, it should be early morning. It's still dark outside. They're all wet. Their uniforms, their clothing are all wet. They're tired. They're hungry. And then they have to wait for the enemy. They waited eight hours. They couldn't even move their head up because otherwise they would be spotted. Oh yeah, excellent. Check this out. This rock wall will be very important. And I'm super happy that they included it in the movie. Now during the actual battle, it's actually the IRA riflemen that stacked up all the rocks to form their wall. Because there wasn't really that much cover and it wasn't that close to the road, but it wasn't that far either. So the positioning... But like I told you, it wasn't done in broad daylight. It's too obvious. Oh yeah, check this out. A Lewis gun. The IRA wish they had access to these during the actual battle. Now in reality, the IRA flying column commanded by Tom Berry was only equipped with a variety of rifles. And each man only had 35 rounds. Now some people in the group also had revolvers and overall this entire unit only had two hand grenades. That alone tells you that the ambush had to be short. They don't want this to turn into a lengthy firefight that they're under equipped for. Oh yeah, there's the guy, the main character of the movie, plays in the Peaky Blinders. Funny, it's set during the same era. Alright, the man on the right with the British uniform is played, represents Tom Berry. Now he's not wearing a British officer uniform just for fun or to show his men who's in charge. The goal is to lure the upcoming British convoy. Tom Berry was actually a World War I veteran of the British Army. And that day he was the actual commander of this flying column of 36 riflemen of the IRA. He must have been pretty scared, you know, he's the one fully exposing himself. If the ambush fails, he's the first one to die. But remember, these men they were hungry, they were tired, all day waiting for the enemy. And I wish that in the movie we could sense this anxiety. And I'm sure a lot of these IRA volunteers before the ambush were thinking, what the hell am I doing here? So he's the, the commander in the, the movie. Bro, no, even the Teletubbies could hide better than that. This is not what I call ideal camouflage. Let me know what you think. But to me at least, the IRA guys stick out crazy. Anyone coming up the road will notice some hats and brown jackets in the green scenery. But look how far they're all from one another. The commander only has visual contact, but not, he can't speak to them. So that's going to be a massive problem. So this scene is beautiful, but it's also amazingly unrealistic. The commander here is effectively cut from half his men on the other side. Now we're talking about the tactics. Other than that, the weapons, they're correct. The uniforms they're wearing is what civilians at the time would wear. So that's excellent. Imagine this was done today. You would see guys wearing their Adidas sweatpants, some sports club hoodie with an NYC cap. But the other reason they're also doing that is after the ambush, they want to spread out and go back home and do as if they're normal citizens. So if they have a uniform, it will be easy for the British to spot who's part of the IRA. So now they're waiting in the show, in the movie. 
it takes a second, but in reality, eight hours. Okay, I'm calling a timeout. The problem is that the ambush side does not look at all like that. And if you think I'm harsh, Tom Berry himself said it. Looking at this spot now, 45 years afterwards, the first thing I remark is that even though this side is practically unchanged, over here I'm glad to see a wood has been planted and it indeed looks a very, very different place to the place that the 3rd Brigade flying column came to on that rather fateful Sunday. Now I want you to pay attention to this landscape. Make sure to check the forest, the greenery, and also this little bend in the road. Now compare it to how the actual ambush site was in 1920. There were no forests or high grass. It was literally flat, fully exposed grassland. The only place the IRA could hide was behind these rocks, which formed some sort of boulders right next to the road. And this is exactly why Tom Berry chose this spot. He also knew that his men were for the most part inexperienced fighters. But he also knew that there were no bad shooters at 10 meters. He positioned his men so they could practically fire at point blank. At this point you guys know I'm a nerd for military tactics. So let's compare how the men are positioned in the movie versus what actually happened. So looking back at the footage, this is what I came up with. There are about 18 IRA fighters. We can see the command post with the yellow star and the guy in British uniform next to the motorcycle on the road. The problem is that they're expecting two or three British trucks filled with men. It's very important because Hollywood taught us that a small group of men hidden can destroy a column of hundreds of men during an ambush. <coughs> the Patriot. But reality is much different. The ones setting the ambush want to have a significant numerical advantage. If not, they're the ones that are gonna get flanked and encircled. That's why Tom Berry knew exactly what he was doing. The biggest unknown was that he didn't know whether he would face two trucks, 18 auxiliaries, or three trucks with 27 British troops, which makes a massive difference for a small force like the IRA had during the Kill Michael ambush. You'll notice how in the movie they're positioned in a U shape. Again, thank you Hollywood. That was maybe good in ancient times, but with firearms it could cause some massive friendly fire. To avoid that, soldiers are usually taught to place themselves in an L formation. The short end of the L blocks the enemy convoy, and then most troops are positioned along the long end of the L, and that causes some crossfire on the enemy, but that also avoids some friendly fire. Now this is how Tom Berry actually positioned his men. And it's actually very close to the L formation. So here the commander, Tom Berry, is the yellow star, and he wanted his most loyal men, his best riflemen, next to him, at the command post. Very important because they would have to block the convoy. And this is what you can see near the motorcycle. And the men from this command post were also hidden behind a rock wall, perfect for cover, concealment. You can have many men side by side, but also provides decent cover against enemy bullets. Then the other second most important position was a section of seven men positioned about 200 yards away from the command post. Their role was to hold off a potential third British truck and hold long enough until trucks 1 and 2 are cleared. He then positioned a group of 10 riflemen right next to his command post to eliminate truck number 1 as fast as possible. As you can see here, the IRA riflemen were actually hidden behind rocks, behind massive boulders. Not only is it better for concealment, but also against enemy fire. With his position completed, he still didn't want the British to be able to withdraw to a safer position on the other side of the road, so he positioned six men there just to make sure that the British don't go there. The reason I'm showing you this is because the IRA had carefully planned this ambush for days and Tom Berry told his men either they win a spectacular victory or they will be all dead by the end of the day. Oh yeah, that's good. They did have scouts, unarmed scouts, ahead of their position to warn of the British coming, but these riflemen must have been so stressed. I can't imagine. Oh yeah, check this out. This is great. We see the commander holding a short magazine Lee Infield number one, Mark three. This one here on top. It was the standard rifle of the British Army, of the Black and Tans, the Auxiliaries, everyone. And that also means it was the most common rifle used by the IRA. However, through illegal imports, they also got foreign weapons, like the one at the bottom, namely a Gewehr 1898, the German World War I rifle. Oh yeah. 
I really hate to stop every two seconds, but there's a lot of material to cover in a short amount of time. In reality, the trucks were much more apart, about 800 yards each. It might seem like a small detail, but the reason is during an ambush, you don't want your trucks to be back to back. Otherwise, they would be both caught in the firefight. If you spread out, group number two can help number one and vice versa. Oh, I'm stressed. <laughs> oh my god. Can you imagine they notice? Oh, look at these uniforms. Look at that. Not your typical World War I British uniform, eh? These were auxiliaries, aka the auxiliary division of the Royal Irish Constabulary. Took me three takes to get it right. Now, auxiliaries are often confused with the infamous Black and Tans. Both were ex-British soldiers, they both took part in counterinsurgency operations, and both basically wore the same outfit. We're talking about the typical British army khaki, and instead of a helmet, they wore a Balmoral cap with their unit's insignia on it. Whereas usually the bad guys, the black and tans, usually wore some dark green. I don't know if you can see, but basically the same color as I'm wearing. Hold on, no! Are we the baddies? Now the main difference between the auxiliaries and the black and tans is that the auxiliaries were ex-British officers. All had experience from the First World War, and they proved to be much more effective than the black and tans, who had a reputation for brutality. One of the reasons we can think about is that the Black and Tans were usually recruited from the lower ranks of the army, ex-soldiers who had a hard time fitting into civilian society after the Great War. So you can imagine the type of guys that would join this unit. Oh shit! Okay, this is literally from Tom Barry's account. He exploded himself through the grenade, but we can't see his command post. Massive firefight. Quick pause, keep in mind that the IRA want the firefight to be over as fast as possible. The auxiliaries here have at least two to three times more rounds. I would love to see the guys from the ambush stressed. They're supposed to be inexperienced men. Now they're fighting as if they have no emotions. Also, notice how nobody's yelling, whether we're talking about the IRA or even the men, the British soldiers on the road. Like the battle feels very silent, feels like a rehearsal. You don't even hear men getting hit or wounded or anything. It's very silent, you only hear guns. Also notice, the battle is taking place at a long range. Very, too, it's too, too long. I mean, yes, the effective range of a short magazine in Lee Infield was about 500 meters, but that's in the hands of an experienced fighter, not in the hands of inexperienced IRA riflemen. Like I told you before, in reality, they were only 10 meters away from the road. You, you can't miss. Hit the enemy hard, eliminate all forces and withdraw because there are thousands of British troops in Ireland ready to get you. I mean, it looks good. I'm, I'm satisfied, but it would have been good to see men struggle to reload. It's literally, Maybe the first time they actually fire a gun, what happened in reality is that they fix bayonet and simply charge the enemy at close range. I don't know if they did it on their own, but maybe they've been ordered to it to save ammunition as well. So you see, battle's over, cease fire, but he, he needs a whistle, but people would not hear his, his whistle in a normal battle. Because the enemy is still firing. <laughs> They're not ceasing fire. Also, a command post on the hill, you see the problem is that he only has direct access to four men around him. A third of his fighting force. So that's true. Some soldiers went down to, to see what happened. A lot of the IRA fighters had bayonets attached for close quarter fighting. Now, a lot of the British soldiers here are in the grass. Like I told you, there wasn't all this cover 
Most of them were shot immediately after getting off the first truck, so there should be a cluster of bodies near the truck, which we kind of see, but so-so. Oh no, they missed half the battle! Oh, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a bit disappointed. When the first truck was attacked, the second truck actually attempted to get out of the ambush. But these British lorries were so bad that when the driver pulled back and reversed, the entire mechanism broke down and the truck got stuck in a ditch. And what happened is that once the IRA fighters were done with truck one, they moved all their fire, they concentrated all their fire on truck number two. But that second battle was actually the most difficult one because the British guys had time to spread out and form some sort of defense perimeter. Oh my god, it would have been so great to see the second part. I'm a bit mad because it was too easy. It wasn't that easy in reality. Okay, one man dead. Okay, they're talking about IRA guy. <laughs> So that's true, they, they had a couple casualties. So my bad, now we see the bodies of the British troops. There's also a massive debate, I don't want to go too much in depth, but basically the auxiliaries of the second truck attempted to surrender. Tom Berry and many IRA fighters say that the auxiliaries actually attempted a false surrender. They said, stop the fighting, put down the rifles, and this is when the auxiliaries pulled out some revolvers and shot down the IRA riflemen that came down. And of course, the guys that got shot were among the most inexperienced. They fell for this trick. Tom Barry felt really bad that he didn't warn his men about this trick. But in the end, they finished off all the men for the second truck. So this is the aftermath. Oh, it's good. They're picking up their weapons, at least. They should be picking their weapons and their ammunition. Because the IRA didn't even have enough rifles for all their members. Now, I don't know if they actually did that. Many believe they, they actually left immediately. The longer they wait, the more British troops can fall upon them. Now, quickly, there's another scene. This is more the black and tans. You know, they went into houses, attacked civilians. And you see they have the dark green <laughs> uniform. So basically, the rule of thumb is that the auxiliaries wore the khaki uniform and the baddies, the black and tans wore the dark green. All right, guys, that's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you want to help me create more content like that, don't forget to support me on Patreon. Link in the description.